Well, good morning, Covenant. Good to see you here. Uh, take your copy of God's Word. Join me in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, we are in our final two weeks of a series entitled Return of the King. While you're turning, uh, we're going to have another giveaway. Uh, we said at the outset of this series together that uh, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of questions people are going to have. And in a venue like this that's limited to about eight or nine weeks of study of the Scriptures, you're not going to be able to cover everything. Some of you don't want to cover everything. Others of you, by contrast, would love to do a really deep dive. And so uh, along the way, we've just recommended some resources for you if you want to take those deep dives. I'm going to be talking about some interpretive approaches to uh, the, the, this teaching around the end of the age, both when it comes to texts like Matthew 24, but also when it comes to entire books of the Bible, like, for example, Revelation. And so today we're giving away a commentary on the book of Revelation. We're going to give, give away two of them at the nine o'clock. We're going to give away another two uh, at the, uh, just, just here in just a moment. I'm going to announce those names. Steve Gregg is a scholar out of Oregon. And what he did in this particular commentary is he brought together uh, scholars from a variety of understandings. How do we interpret Revelation? Do we interpret it, for example, in a, in a, with a pre tierist lens that tells us that most of that stuff got fulfilled by the end of the first century? Do we look at it in a futurist lens that tells us that pretty much from chapter 4 on, everything is still yet to be? A historicist lens, an, an idealist lens. You're going to hear me repeat some of those phrases today, just to kind of give you the broad overview. But what you'll find, if you want to go deeper in the weeds, is that there are resources like this that provides you with solid scholarship and accurate, fair representation across the spectrum of views. And so we're going to announce a couple of names here in just a moment. And the it's same deal as the other resources that we've given away. If you're the kind of individual who's excited about this, it's your gift. Take it home. And although I commend it to all of you, we can only give away a couple of them today. If you win it and you're the kind of individual who says, you know, I really don't want to know that much about it. That's fine too. Just hold it up when you get out there. We won't be offended. There's going to be a fellow nerd like me or somebody else that says, hey, I want that resource and you'll probably meet a new friend. So the winners in this service of those two resources, you'll each just go right back through these doors to the check-in table and pick up your free commentary, John Simpson and Stacy Freeman. Congratulations to you. Sometimes there's some tangible reward, right, from coming to church. Enjoy this. You know, anytime you talk about eschatology, the second coming, anything prophetic in nature with the Bible, it, you're talking about things that are intriguing. And the reason sometimes that they're intriguing is because they're so often complex and sometimes they're difficult to figure out. And we are, by, by nature, human beings, we like to get our hands around things. We, we sometimes feel very uncomfortable. There are very few of us that actually walk in ambiguity easily. We, we like to have everything figured out. We want every T crossed. We want every I dot and we will hunt down the truth until we find out what actually happens. And, and to people like that, things like this can drive you nuts because you spend endless hours trying to figure out how all of this fits together. And so today what we're going to look at is possibly the most difficult passage in the entire New Testament. It's certainly the most, biblical, the, the, the most difficult passage in the, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and there are several reasons for this. Number one is that Jesus uses some unfamiliar language here and he mixes uh, his, his genres. So, th so there's some prophetic, which is our way of saying some things that are predictive about the future and what's coming in the future. And there are also apocalyptic uh, expressions, language that is coded and, and is sort of an unveiling of things that spiritually lie behind the scenes. And so sometimes we get those two confused. We think prophetic and, prophet and, and apocalyptic are the same thing. And they do have a significant amount of overlap in the Bible, but they're really two different kinds of, of literary genre. And so understanding that is key to understanding this text. But Jesus often will switch back and forth, even in the same sentence, between the apocalyptic and the the prophetic, and that makes it a little bit difficult to get our heads around. A second thing that makes this difficult is that Jesus doesn't make chronological distinctions. He's not describing necessarily something that this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen. And, and so you don't always know exactly where in the story you are. You need to read it two, maybe three times. You need to read some commentaries. You need to stand on the shoulders of men and women who've come before us for the last 2,000 years to really get our heads around it. It's a lot like the movie, um, I, I'm trying to remember the, the title now, oh, 1517 to Paris. Uh, any of you see that movie? 
It was about the, the military veterans, and they were touring Europe together, so they were on leave. But they it, it found themselves in the middle of an attempted terrorist attack on a train, and they were able to rescue the people on the train, stop the terrorist attack. It's a great movie full of heroism and nobility and all kinds of great things. But I had a hard time watching it because there were several points in the plot of the movie where they would flash back. Right? And when you flash back to when they're kids, and they're 12 and 13 years old, that's obvious. Okay, that's when they're kids. But they were flashing back to times when, when they were still living part of their adult life. And you're wondering, exactly where is this in the storyline? And so I found myself hitting pause a lot, backing up to a previous frame a lot, because it confused me. Because it wasn't in chronological order. And Jesus' description of the future here in Matthew 24 reads a little bit like that. And because of those first two realities, the mixing of genres and it not being in chronological order, there has not been a solid consensus among scholars as to the precise meaning of several things that we're going to read in this passage together. In fact, the more study that is done and the deeper students of Scripture get into this text, the more debate seemingly arises. And so what I want to do, just by way of introductions, I want to give you generally the four primary schools of thought on how these things are supposed to be understood, the primary ways, they, they also kind of correlate to the primary ways students of Scripture would understand a book like Revelation, okay? So these are the four schools of thought. Try to stay with me here. The first is called preterism, and advocates of preterism say that in Matthew 24, Jesus is speaking solely about things that are going to happen in the immediate future of he and his disciples. There's nothing there that is in your future or mine. That's what the preterists would say. It all was fulfilled by the time of 70 AD, by the time that the temple had been destroyed. Now, that advocate, the big, biggest advocate, most recent of that view is a guy named R.C. Sproul. Sproul wrote a book called The Last Days According to Jesus. It was an exegesis of this passage, and that's what Dr. Sproul believed. I love Dr. Sproul. Uh, he has influenced my life and ministry in profound ways. He went to be with Jesus just about three years ago. You say, yeah, but pastor, is he right? No, he's not right. Are you sure he's not right? No, not really. You see how all this works? You got to hang with me here. That's preterism. Everything's already been fulfilled. Contrasted with that, almost really on the other end of the spectrum, is futurism. This view advocates nearly everything that the preterist position denies. So the futurist would say, most, if not all, of this passage is describing things that even from our own perspective in history are yet to come. All right? Preterism, it's all already happened. Futurism, hardly any of it's happened yet. Right in the middle, in between there, is this third view called historicism, which says that this prophecy is a pre-written record of the entire course of history from the time of the first century until the end of the world. And often what would happen, this is the way the reformers like Luther and Calvin dealt with this particular view, they believed there was one-to-one -one correspondence to the wider history of the church, not merely to their own time. I find that position attractive, but I find it ultimately unsatisfying without, this for, without at least some elements of this fourth position, which is called idealism. Idealism teaches that the prophetic teaching is a dramatic presentation of transcendent spiritual realities that lie behind world events. So when you see certain things like warfare or famines or other things happening in the world, there's a spiritual reality that's behind the scenes and prophetic words like Jesus are designed to pull back the veil and show us what's happening and that these things happen not just once, not just way back then, not just in the present time, but they happen in cycles throughout history all the way up until the end of the age. And after almost 30 years of studying the Bible, I, I do find that position mixed in with some elements of the others uh, to be the most satisfying because I think it's like those of John and Revelation, more, a more panoramic description of repeated cycles of historical moments from his own time, from his immediate future, and from our own. Am I right? Probably. All right. Could I be wrong? Sure, I could be. Probably not. Will I discover I'm wrong? And will I be okay with that if I discover I'm wrong? I'm totally fine with that. And, and that's really my point here. It's okay to study the issues. It's okay to have an opinion, to get into the weeds on this kind of thing. It's fine to be confident even in those things. But given the fact that 2,000 years of faithful Christian scholarship around the globe has produced no final global consensus among God's people, some humility is in order here. You following me? 
Follow me on that. When you get to the point that you know everybody who doesn't agree with you is either a heretic or they're teaching something that's harmful, your confidence has crossed the line into hubris. That's something the Bible calls pride. Don't mistake pride for confidence. Be humble even as you are confident in your own studies. So here's how I would kind of lay that out for you. There's a chart I'm going to throw up. If you're, it's only going to come up for a few minutes. So if you, if you want a copy of it, you'll be able to get it. There's some show notes attached to every sermon that I preach. So if you go to the podcast or the website, you can actually, you'll actually be able to download this even to your phone. And so what do we make, for example, of, of Jesus' description of false Christs, top left? Well, if you think as a pre terrorist that it was fulfilled by 70 AD, you think he's referring to Jewish prophets who predict that God will deliver Jews from Rome. If you think it's more of a final fulfillment, then you're looking toward like Antichrist who deceives many by his words and his deeds. When you read what his description is of war and famine and, and earthquakes, uh, if you see that as a first century fulfillment, well, Ro Rome did have multiple wars and famines during that time, particularly the time of Claudius. But if you see this as more of an end times kind of tr uh, thing, then you see the troubles of this life that we're experiencing now, that they increase greatly toward the end. Now, we can go on through that chart, but here's my question. Why can't it be yes? Like, why, why can't it just be all of them. Why can't it be more than one? And, and let me tell you why I think that's a worthy question. It's because of how Jesus expresses himself here. Matthew is recording words that were spoken as part of what we call the Olivet Discourse. In other words, Jesus spoke these words from the Mount of Olives, and there were several things that had preceded these words. For one, he had excoriated the Pharisees and the scribes for their legalism and their, their spiritual oppression of other people. He had wept bitterly over Jerusalem and the future that he knew would eventually come to that city and that he had prophesied over that city. And having done that, he now takes a trek with his disciples up on the Mount of Olives on their way from Jerusalem to another place called Bethany. And it's at this one spot where they stop, which incidentally had a spectacular view of Solomon's temple in the distance. So if you can imagine that, Jesus has done some pretty hard stuff. He's had some pretty hard words to say, and he's trekking up this mountain with his disciples, and he stops at this spot with the best possible vista of the city below them. It's just gorgeous, and Solomon's temple prominently displayed right in the middle. And so I want you to imagine as he and the disciples are looking at that view, he says the words that we read in verse 2. You see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, that had to be stunning and shocking to his early disciples. And they are so stunned, in fact, that they assume he's talking not merely about the destruction of the temple that we, knew come, we, we know comes a little less than a half century later, but also the end of the world itself. Um, and, and we we experienced something 20 years ago yesterday that, that allows us to, to, to relate to that in some way, right? 20th anniversary of 9-11, that was a big day, wasn't it? I remember where I was. I remember my mother-in-law calling me and telling me, because didn't, we didn't have smartphones back then, so I had to get to a television. You remember those days? So I had to, you got to get to a TV and you need to turn it on. Something big is going down in New York. And I turned it on just about eight or nine minutes before I, in horror, watched that American Airlines flight live go right into the other tower. And then we saw it, we, we saw the terrorists attack the Pentagon. And then we saw another plane go down in a, in a Pennsylvania field. And I remember everything I felt that day. And I remember that the world did not come to an end. But from my position as a Westerner, as an, as an American, who at least until that point had enjoyed the, the relative safety of living in a country like mine, I, it kind of felt like the end of the world, didn't it? This is why we were glued to our television. It felt like the end of the world. It certainly was the end of an era. I think all of us can agree. America has never been the same since that day. And it must have felt that way to a lot of other people too, because I remember the next Sunday, a lot of churches filled with people looking for answers. So in the disciples' minds, you need to recognize the destruction of Solomon's temple would have felt like that. The description of something like that, that would have been such a cataclysmic event that at least in their own minds, something like that could scarcely occur without bringing with it the end of the age. And so Jesus responds to that shock and that fear in this way. He says in verse 4, and Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. 
So here's what's coming next, okay? A description of at least two events. George Eldon Ladd, the, the premillennial scholar, calls this the prophetic foreshortening. And what he means by that is there's an overlapping of two events that Jesus is describing here in a single message. You've got the soon coming destruction of the Temple Mount, which will not be the end of the world, but that soon coming destruction will foreshadow a coming end, which will in fact signify the end of the age. And part of the difficulty that we have in understanding these passages is that Jesus kind of switches those around. He's, he, 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 sometimes it's difficult, at least at first reading, to see which one of those relative to which verse you're looking at is being described. It's hard. And so what do we want to focus on today? Jesus says, here's what's going to happen. Here's how you need to respond. All of this out of Matthew 24. So here's three questions I think Jesus wants us to answer. Okay, this is the abundantly clear part. Wherever you land on the chronology, number one, what's going to happen? Number two, how will it affect God's people? Number three, what do we do about it? Okay, so let's take these in order, starting with what's going to happen. We're going to look at this passage from the disciples' place in history, but also from our own, because I think both are appropriate here. And when you look at the immediate fulfillment of so much of what Jesus is talking about, it is stunning to note the accuracy of Jesus' predictions. And there are six graphic descriptions here, beginning with this. Jesus says, beginning now and until the end of the age, there will be false teachers and there will be false Christs. He says in verse 5, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will lead many astray and many false prophets, verse 11 says, will arise and lead many astray. Now, without even considering all of that in our own time, just, let's just think for a moment about how that would have been fulfilled in the first century. If you go to any good library today, public or private, and you just browse through the history of what's called Gnostic literature, written in the first century, you will find multiple mentions of messianic pretenders. People whose views were antithetical to the faith given by the apostles. Many professing Christians were led astray as a result of that. Basically, you're on this straight and narrow road that Jesus described in Matthew 7, but there's all these exit signs and they blink like a Vegas show. They're attractive. Come over here and look at this. Come over here and try out that. And there's some, some Jesus attached to it. And so there's some confusion around that. Here he is. Here he is. Go over here. And it keeps us from staying on that road. We see exactly the same thing today, just as we have seen throughout history. It can happen through official cult groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. It can happen in these nationalist culture warriors and QAnon conspirators, liberal Christian views, that, uh, uh, groups that espouse Marxism, promote sexual immorality as somehow okay, pro the prosperity gospel. I could go on and on and on and on, but there's all kinds of false teaching. I am, this is the way. Go this way, go this way. Watch out for the false teachers. Those false teachers, secondly, will cause constant conflict. Look at verse 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation. That's, that's the, the, the term ethnos that describes ethnic groups. There's going to be racial tension. And kingdom against kingdom, basileia, basileia. This, this is borders and governments. They're going to, different state actors are going to turn on each other. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Now, in the first century, there was a rumor of war in AD 40 when Caligula, who was the emperor at the time, attempted to erect a statue of himself in the temple at Jerusalem. You can imagine the Jews were not fans of that sort of thing. And we know in, in this history, Romans and Jews didn't agree on much during the, the, the former's occupation of the latter. But if you read both their histories around this time, you'll find one thing they did agree on. There was a lot of conflict. There was a lot of conflict. They each thought the other was to blame, but they agreed. There's a lot of polarization. There's a lot of conflict. And if we fast forward today, not a lot's changed, has it? And, and I have not lived, and I was born in 1972. I have not lived, nor has any generation before that's still alive right now lived during a time when there wasn't conflict somewhere plaguing the world. There may have been even relative peace and stability here in the West, but somewhere in the world, there's always been conflict somewhere. Same with natural disasters. Not, not even a generation after these words were spoken, a major earthquake strikes the region of Phrygia in AD 61. Pompeii, that famed area, was leveled in AD 63. Antioch, which is probably where Matthew writes 
his gospel saw a large city reshaping earthquake in AD 37, then another one in 42, and then another one in 115. There's going to be war, there's going to be conflict, there are going to be natural disasters, and in the midst of all of that, thirdly, there are going to be false starts. Look at verse 8. All of these are the beginning of birth pangs. Ladies, you ever have, ladies any of you ever have a false alarm when you were pregnant, especially with that first one? Right? You, you feel whatever, whatever it is y'all feel when you think it's coming and you're like, I think it's time. And then you, you, you grab your, your husband or your, da, your dad, you know, and you, go, and you get that bag that you, you've packed because you're ready to go to the hospital. And you just know this is it. This is it. And you get to the ER and 10 minutes later, the nursing staff goes, yeah, no, it's not. That's frustrating, right? Jesus says history's going to be a little bit like that. It, is this, whoa, well, well, maybe this is it. Well, well, maybe this is it. And then you're going to have people, some of those false teachers, this is it. This is, yeah, no, it's not. Okay. When you have the same people over and over again, this is going to be it. It's going to happen before 2020. Something's going to happen in October. Something's going to happen in April. Something, about, you, this is going to be real sad. Just tell them, shut up. Okay. Uh, just, just tell them to hush. It's foolishness. Because that's what he, he said, you've got to be careful about this kind of stuff. False starts. Lots of confusion about the time of the, uh, the end. This is it. No, no, it's really not. Fourthly, separation by tribulation. Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Now, these, these, it's passages like this that scare pastors who really love their people. And, and I'm going to tell you why. It's because Jesus says here, you're going to be tested and many of you are going to fail. That's what he says. Makes me shiver a bit. Particularly when I consider what we've been through the last 18 months, that by contrast to what we see described here is a rather minor inconvenience reacted to with just the spastic way some Christians have lit their hair on fire. And I, and I watch that and I compare it to what I, what I see here. You will be tested and many will fail. And I just want to go, I, I, because I love you, what are you going to do when the real persecution starts? What are you, what are you going to do? Spiritual deterioration, that's where some people will go. Verse 12, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will go, grow cold. They're going to lose their faith. Contrast with this, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Here's what he's saying. Some people are going to get very tired of suffering, and they're going to give up. That scares me. That scares me. They're going to fall away. You know, culture doesn't respect me like they used to because I believe Jesus is Lord or, or this isn't the same environment or the same culture or the same country or whatever. You, you, you've been living for the present world rather than the next one to the extent, not that those discussions are not important, but it's to the extent that's all you think about and you obsess about it. And eventually, if, that's, if that becomes your Messiah, you're just going to give up. You're going to walk away. You're going to do it for the same reason other people have struggles with different other parts of their life. Uh, you know, it, it's been interesting to me to watch the sexual revolution that's happened in the last 10 or 15 years, really just in the last five years uh, here, here in North America, and particularly in, in the U.S. It's, it's people that, you know, they're going to they want to go sleep with somebody that God doesn't want them to sleep with. And so they, they deconstruct, which is a new word for saying, all right, I'm going I'm to pull apart my faith. Maybe it really doesn't mean this, doesn't mean that. And on the surface, it looks kind of really introspective and really deep, but, but it you can kind of tell that all it really is, is I want to do something that God's told me is forbidden. And so I'm going to rewrite everything or perhaps even just leave the Christian faith altogether because I want to do this thing. And the evidence of that is when they come out with these questions that have been addressed for 2000 years in history. And look, it's okay to struggle with the problem of evil. It's okay to struggle with the Odyssey, to deal with all of these. But there, there are questions that every generation has to deal with. We're amenable to that. We love having those conversations. But the way you know it's fake is when someone who just wants to disobey or who just wants an alternative route to some sort of messianic thing says, well, I'm just not a Christian anymore because 
I ask this question, and nobody's talking about the problem of evil. For 2,000 years, people have been writing about it, dummy. You can go get a book. You can talk to one of us. We can have it. But don't, don't make up this stuff just because you're intellectually lazy and you don't want to study and you're operating on the basis of your experience. That's what happens. That's called spiritual deterioration. The love of many will grow cold. And that happens. And yet right in the middle of all that, we're given a glimmer of hope. We're told that there will be forward progress of the gospel. Look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. The gospel still goes forward. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 16, on this rock, and he's speaking of Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It is on the basis of that confession that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. We are on the offensive and nothing can stop my church. So even in the middle of all the deterioration and everything crumbling around us, there is a solid rock foundation on which we can stand And the call here is to make sure that that's where we stand because that's the only thing going forward and it's the only thing that's going to last. And Jesus tells us that's going forward to the whole world and it's going to be a testimony to all nations. Now, now today we speak of two groups of people when we talk about missions. We talk about unreached peoples, which doesn't mean there are no Christians there. It does mean there's not a significant enough stronghold of Christianity in that particular culture that an indigenous church is there. So, for example, if you go to Cameroon and there's a church that was started by somebody that looks like me and is still led by people that look like me, that's th- those people are still unreached. What you want is a Cameroonian church with Cameroonian elders and deacons and Cameroonian language and worship styles and Cameroonian views of, of governance related to and, and intersected with what the New Testament would teach us about the way the church is, is ought, to be, ought to be governed. Those are, those are unreached, but there are still Christians there. There's another group of people called the unengaged peoples. Like the Tukam Bessi Selatan of Indonesia. This is a tribe of 130,000 followers of Islam. They have no access to the Bible. They have no missionary in their midst to reach them. They have no indigenous churches and zero Christians. And guys, people like that are why we're going to give over $100,000 this year to global engagement. It's why we believe in the Great Commission. But, but sometimes we can get confused when we read these words of Jesus and think, well, that means that Jesus can't come back until we've reached those people. And that's not really what this means, because if you broaden your scope a little bit to think about the whole of human history, particularly the last 2,000 years, the truth is, while there are many tribes among us right now on this earth among whom there's no witness of the gospel, history demonstrates there's not a single ethnic group at this moment that at some point in history has not been reached. And what we observe with clarity from the time of Jesus to our own is there's a faithful remnant of God's people who continue to move forward. So I want you to get the picture. Wars and rumors of wars, false Christ, all kinds of attractive exit ramps that allow you to jump off and desert your faith. And Jesus says, a lot of people will, but there's going to be a remnant that remain faithful to me. And those people will move forward. Those are the people that we see in the Roman arena in the first and second centuries facing death by being eaten by lions, looking back at Caesar before they are eaten and saying, Jesus is Lord. Those are the people when Rome itself fell and the barbarians invaded and civilizational chaos engulfed that part of the West. They said, Jesus is Lord. Those are the people that when the Black Plague ravaged Europe, they ran toward people rather than away from them and said, Jesus is Lord. When they've been chased throughout the Middle East and throughout every single age, That's been their cry, and this is how their behavior has reflected what they believe. Jesus is Lord. And Jesus says, this is what will happen. So let me me give you again kind of a synopsis of what's happened here. The disciples want a timeline. Does that sound familiar? When does this happen? What's going to go down, right? They want a timeline. We want a timeline. Jesus instead gives them, and he gives us. A dose of reality that's going to characterize their world and will characterize our world. See, he told us 2,000 years ago that when he, until he returns, there will never again be an age in in which this, his followers don't have to live with some of these realities. We have to accept this. We need to endure it, but we are also given the promise that one day 
we will be delivered out of it. Yeah, don't, don't act too much like this world is your home, is the point. Don't do it. That brings us to the second question. How will it affect God's people? And the answer is threefold. Number one, instability. So look at verse 15. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, and all of us say, well, we're trying to, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So, Jesus is referring to something that Daniel said. More precisely, something Daniel said in chapter 9, verse 25 of his prophecy that described, at least in the future of his own day, a, a man named Antiochus IV. In 167 B.C., Antiochus goes in, he invades the temple, he slaughters a pig on the altar in the temple. Most of the Jews at that point understood that to have fulfilled Daniel's prophecy. But Jesus seems to suggest there's something more coming. Something beyond this. Eusebius in, in 67 AD declared this prophecy fulfilled when the Jews fled persecution to the mountains of Pella. Something is coming after this. But it's instability. And that instability is further described for us in verse 17. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. In other words, they're going to come such calamity and it's going to come on us with such rapidity that there will not be time for you to even gather provisions. You just got to up and run. You just got to go. He continues in verse 19, Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in these days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. Something that was a common experience in the first century, both for pregnant women and winter travelers, was very difficult mobility. And so if you're pregnant and traveling in winter, that's bad. And so this is what he's saying. It's going to be everything around you is going to be as unstable as a pregnant woman traveling in winter. That's basically what he's saying. Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. For if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, that's those who put their faith in Jesus, day, those days will be cut short. So this brings us to a question. about it. For about 190 years now, there's been a teaching about a foot that started in Great Britain, got imported to the United States, it became very popular through the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible, that there's something called a rapture that's coming prior to everything that Jesus describes, and that God's people will escape that. And so what they would say is, well, the tribulation that's being described is, is for unbelievers, it's not for believers. And I, you know what? I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I hope they're right. Because okay, I'm normal. I, I don't want to go through anything more harsh than I'm going through right now. I get that. It's, it's one of, and it's also one of those areas where I admit that I could be wrong. There are a lot of colleagues of mine and brothers that I love in the pastorate and in academic Christian works and, and institutions who believe in a, in a pre-tribulational rapture. I, I don't think it's heretical to believe in such a thing, although you, you won't find me touting it. I don't believe in it. But, but I think the problem occurs when in light of that doctrine, you start to focus on everything you're going to escape, especially in light of what Jesus has told us. Well, we're not going to be here, so that doesn't, none of that really matters. I don't know how in the world you make that square with the very clear words of Jesus here. I don't. But even if you can, there is no assurance that we will always be able to live in some bubble and never have to deal with persecution. In fact, it's just the opposite. We've seen this throughout history. Did you know, by the way, that in the 20th century, starting in 1900 and 2000, if you just take that small slice of history and pull it out from the rest of human history, you will discover that more people in that 100-year period gave their lives for the gospel. They were killed, all right? Not told to put their Bible in a locker, not challenged and maybe embarrassed by some professor on a college campus, murdered because they believed Jesus was Lord. More of them in the 20th century than in all of the other 19th centuries combined. Did you know that? That's the world we live in. We're, we're isolated from that to a large extent, which may explain our light our hair on fire reaction to any little bitty thing we don't agree with, but that's another sermon for another day. Instability. Instability. So pray for the persecuted church. But even more than that, 
let's grasp something of their perspective. I shared the story with you several weeks ago about being in India about a decade ago and having a pastor named Ambrose who was from an area about 150 miles northwest of where we were. Hindu fundamentalists had threatened to kill him and torture members of his church. He was going to go back. I don't have any idea to this day whatever happened to Ambrose. But I think if he could hear my brothers and sisters in the West talk about a future tribulation and say, well, that's not something we have to worry about, he might look at us like we were just a tad crazy. And he might have a right to because Jesus told us we're going to live in a world that on, on occasion, even in the safety of the West where we live, is going to reveal its instability. We've experienced just a small microcosm of that in the last 18 months. And after seeing the way so many Western Christians have responded, I, I just, I, I, I'm just being honest with you. I'm not angry. I'm not, I'm not trying to put anybody down or judge me. I love you, but I'm like, are you, do you seriously believe you're ready for, the, for what's coming? Do you really believe that you're ready? And so, I don't like that. That's not encouraging. I don't feel good. I, want, I don't write the mail. I just deliver it. And you need to pay attention to it because otherwise... And this is something else that Jesus tells us is coming, tempting substitutes. Verse 23, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, so if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Think about being on, on, a, on a highway, and here's a big exit. Here he is. Go here. Go here. Take this exit. You, you keep on going. Don't get off track. You, you, you stay on the right road because what's going to happen? They're promising you a quick way out of this through money, through power, through influence, through pleasure. And they'll even be able to do some things tangibly to make you think they're legitimate. You need discernment in that moment. You need discernment. Here's the good news. Even in the midst of all of that instability and those advertised exit ramps, there's a call to clarity. And it comes in verse 27. Here's why you don't need it. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west... So will be the coming of the Son of Man. When he come, when the real thing happens, it's going to be obvious, people. So this is why, right? When you see the exit sign, hey, he's over here. Go over there. He's, he's over there. Go in that room and see if you can find him. Go out in the wilderness and see if you can find him. No, you stay right on the road because that's not real. How do you know it's not real? Because when the real thing happens, nobody's going to question it. Nobody's going to wonder. Nobody's going to speculate. Nobody's going to write a book about blood moons. It's just going to happen. And the Lord tells us here, this is what it's going to be like. It's like lightning that just lights up from this side of the sky to the other. You will not miss it. There will be no question. And then he says, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. It's like when you see buzzards flying in a circle around here. This, it's, it's getting about that time of year, isn't it? You know, it, there's somebody probably either shot a deer or they hit a deer. Hopefully. Early in my ministry, a guy brought me several pounds of deer meat, and I, I was very appreciative of it. I was pastoring in Kentucky, and I said, uh, I said, how'd you get him? Did you get him, with, did you get him with, a, with a bow? Did you get him with a crossbow? Did you get him with a gun? He said, I got him with an F-150. <laughs> and so, yeah, well, you know what? He ate good, so that works. All right, we know. It's like when those circling vultures are doing their thing. We need, it's like, you won't have to quit. Is this it? If you... That's the point. If you have to ask, then it isn't. Jesus says when the real thing transpires, everybody's going to know. That, this is the hard truth as we move closer and closer to the end of the age. Nowhere, okay? Every, every area of the world has different sins that they deal with. So if you're, if you're preaching in India or you're preaching in North Africa or you're preaching in Europe or you're preaching in South America, there are going to be different things that have to be addressed because relative to where we are and the, the cultural presumptions that we tend to give into and just sort of accept by default, we don't think very clearly and sometimes we, we, we don't 
we, we don't follow Jesus as faithfully as we should. It's, it's going to look different for every culture. For the West, it's this. It's this. The Christian faith is not every day at Disney. That's not what it is. It's not fun and games. It's hard. Nowhere does God promise us protection from temporary persecution. Nowhere are we given a strategy in the Bible that says we have to save our country or our culture. Our calling is to endure. You be faithful, you believe God's word, and you understand what's going to happen, how will it affect God's people. Then you ask this final question, what do we do? What do we do with this? Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, The sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other." Continue to endure. Continue to obey. Continue to take Jesus at his word. Continue to discern truth from error according to the word of God. And when things seem unclear, you cling to the clear. And when they seem unstable, you cling to the stable. Because one day, one day, those who have done this will look up to see our king coming for us. And it's on that day that he will silence every mouth and cause every knee to bow. And gather us up all, all of us to take us home. We're going home. That's the question we have to ask. And that's the point of what Jesus called his disciples to. They wanted a timeline. He gave them a dose of reality and told them to be ready. And then challenged them to endure. That's what's happening today. We want a timeline. We want everything figured out. We want to be like that guy that's, you know, locked and loaded in his basement, and he's got canned goods and ammo and everything else. Cheating on his wife, but he's got all that stuff happening, so he thinks he's ready for the rapture. That, that's the kind of thing. That, that's, the cult, that's what cultural Christianity is. It's, I'm the good guy. Everybody else is the bad guy. That's the kind of stuff that's got to be avoided. It's not about a timeline. It's not about crossing the T's and dotting the I's. It's about knowing what's coming and believing Jesus to the extent that you endure. This, this is why you can't be a theological liberal and live like this. You've got to actually believe Jesus rose from the dead. You have to actually believe that the sky is going to split, that he's going to literally come back, that all of the, the, the books of justice are going to be balanced. Because if you don't believe that, there's no way in blazes you're going to live like this. But some people say they believe all of that, and their life betrays the fact that they don't. So what are we doing? What are we doing? Jesus has answered those questions. This is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to affect the people of God. This is what you do. I love this quote from G.K. Chesterton from nearly a century ago. It is only the fool who tries to get the heavens inside his head. In other words, i got to figure all this out. This is the mind of God. You ain't going to figure it all out. You're just not. It is only the fool who tries to pack all that inside his head. And not unnaturally, his head bursts. The wise man is content to get his head inside the heavens. That's what you and I are supposed to be doing with texts like this. There are things that we may not ever know for sure, but there are also things that we do you get your head inside those heavens and you be faithful until you see him believing no matter what tangibly happens around you or to you or to your family or to your culture jesus is coming and i know what this book is telling me to do i know how it's calling me to love my neighbor i know how it's calling me to live a righteous and a godly life i know how it's calling me to live a quiet and godly life i'm going to be faithful until I see him, because at that point, he's going to be the only ground to stand on. One one picture from history, I think, helps us understand that well. Near the end of World War II, Warsaw, Poland was pretty much leveled. There was nothing left of this city. There There was hardly any infrastructure. Good luck finding clean water. But there was one skeletal structure left standing. It was one wall of the Polish headquarters of the British and Foreign Bible Society. And on that wall, scribbled for everybody to see in that city, 
were these words, heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will never pass away. Do you believe it? Do I believe it? Because see, there may come a day when we have to literally live out that truth. What if you lose everything you got? What if I lose everything I've got? What if God's sovereign plan in history includes us at some point suffering as our brothers and sisters in other places around the world have suffered? What Jesus told us here tells us this. My hope is not in avoiding that pain. It's not. My hope is that Jesus is greater than anything this world throws at me. That's the main point of Matthew 24. Will you endure? Will you be ready? And, and I will tell you, admittedly, not on the basis of experience, because I'm pampered and spoiled just like the rest of y'all, having grown up in the West. But because the Word of God says it, and I really do believe it with all my heart, and my brothers and sisters around the world who have suffered have testified to it, Jesus is greater than anything this world can throw at you. Come to him today and be ready. Be ready for that moment. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for even like the disciples, when we ask the wrong questions, you give us the right answer. And so, Lord, that, that right answer today just tells us to be ready. And I pray in the name of Jesus that, that we would be ready. Lord, I pray for your people to be encouraged not because of circumstances that may improve or stay the same. Lord, we know we're not promised that, but because Jesus is greater and Jesus is better. And so, Father, may we cling to him with all of our might. And may our relationship with him spill out into our relationships with others as we live righteously, as we live godly, as we live generously, as we live sacrificially, as we live in a way that, that demonstrates love of neighbor. Lord, may they see a glimpse of this coming kingdom and may many people, as a result of the way we respond, find entrance into that kingdom before the king returns. And Lord, if there are people here today who have, don't have that relationship, I pray they find it before they leave here. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.